To humans, wake up, wise up, do what you can individually and together. I came across today's topic in kind of a roundabout way. Recently, I was re watching the James Cameron film Titanic. And as I was watching Rose freeze on her floating piece of wood and pry Jack's cold, dead hands from hers as she whispers, I'll never let go, I was wondering just how cold the water actually was when the Titanic sank. A quick Google search told me it was about minus 2.2 degrees Celsius or 27 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you're me and we're taught that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you may have been stumped by the water's ability to be colder than quote unquote freezing. So you do another few Google searches and come to find that water doesn't actually have to freeze at zero Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And continuing the Titanic example, salt water, ambient air temperature, and the sheer size of the volume of the body of water all affect the water's temperature and ability to freeze. Still with me? But then I started wondering just how cold liquid water can still exist before it has to freeze. The answer is minus 55 degrees Fahrenheit, by the way. And then I came across a bit of research about a group of scientists who accidentally created the coldest place in the universe. This is where today's episode picks up. I wanted to understand a bit more about this experiment, how it happened, and what its implications are for real world and important applications. Christian Deppner is my guest today, who is a member of the team that created this ultra-cold capsule of atoms while researching what's called internal wave interferometry. By using a tall drop tower that simulates anti-gravity conditions, Christian and his team at the Center of Applied Space Technology and Microgravity, ZARM, at the University of Brennan in Germany, tried to see just how slow they could get a contained cloud of atoms to move and how accurately they could measure those movements, all the while creating atomic movements so slow, it became the coldest place in the universe. My name is Serena Simons, and yes, we will be talking lots of physics in this episode, but I hope you find it as fascinating as I did. And as always, let us know what you thought of today's episode and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Here's my conversation with physicist Christian Dubner. Christian, thank you so much for joining us on the Earth to Humans podcast. Um, it's really nice to meet you, and we're doing a, a nine-hour time time difference because um, you were over in um, in Germany, right? Yes, I'm in Germany, and it's uh, eight o'clock in the evening, so my workday is uh, almost done. And uh... in your free time, you're going to be talking about your work. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, that's, that's normal behavior for a physicist. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. Can you kind of give us a little bit, um, how did you get involved in physics? You know, where did that kind of passion come from for you? Ooh, where did this passion come from? Um, for a long time during school, interested in physics and chemistry and biology. And uh, after my school, I directly started uh, studying physics in, in Bremen in Germany. Uh, Bremen is also my hometown, so <laughs> it wasn't that long of a way. And from there, I started working uh, for the University of Hanover at the drop tower in Bremen. And uh, it's it's an experiment that caught my attention, that, that sounds very, uh, very interesting, because it was everything combined. It's, it's, it's not the usual work physicists after after uh, study do it's not you work with lasers or you work with electronics or you work with vacuum you work with theoretical physics it's it's everything combined so uh, the work that i had to do was set up build invent things i, I just mm -hmm. wanted to clarify that was all at zarm 
Yes. And ZARM is the Center of Applied Space Technology and Microgravity, correct? Yes. Yes. (laughs) It's a a very, very long name. And uh, yeah, and at ZARM, there's a drop tower. Um, Maybe you've heard about it, maybe Mm -hmm. not. It's a 110 meter high vacuum tube where experimental capsules that are one meter and something in height and 70 centimeters in in, in, in width, uh, where everything uh, is set up, and one drops this capsule down this uh, this uh, 100 meter tube, and during this free fall, we have 4.7 seconds of microgravity. So it's space-like conditions where we can do measurements in weightlessness, and during this 4.7 seconds, everything that that we want to do uh, has to be done, and then after this fall. After this time, uh, the capsule is decelerated in an eight meter high container where it is uh, repaired if something broke. Most of the time, nothing breaks. So that's great. That's good. <laughs> and then this process can be can be uh, repeated. The drop tower, we can only use three times a day mm. because the, the, the whole sequence takes four hours for one drop. Wow. And one day does not have that much hours. Um, Four hours to prepare for like a four second drop. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> um, so we want to characterize as much as possible on ground. Because in the lab, we have we have uh, cycle times for our experiments of four seconds. So every four seconds, we can get another uh, data point. But it sounds like what you guys were able to achieve was not actually the goal. Can you kind of explain you know, how how you kind of got a byproduct that was really cool off of research that didn't really necessarily try to answer that question. Side note, Kelvin scala is defined that zero Kelvin is the lowest possible temperature. So this is a temperature where where no no energy is, is left in the atoms, no no movement, no 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 um, velocity is in the, in the atoms. Because the atoms are basically is, just just frozen out of movement. Frozen and and have no movement. Got it. No kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the word I was I was looking for, and I said it's late in the evening. <laughs> With our research, we want to do matter wave interferometry. It's a very complicated word name. <laughs> Atom or matter wave interferometry can be used to to measure accelerations, uh, for example, on a on a uh, to, to to very high precision. And to do this measurements, we need to observe the atoms for a long time. So the longer the time we can we can observe them, um, the higher the precision will be. That's why we use a drop tower, where we have four seconds instead of 22 milliseconds in the lab. And the atoms falling down in our vacuum chamber is one problem. But the other problem that we have is the atoms have kinetic energy. So this cloud of atoms, when we release it from our magnetic trap, it starts to expand and it gets it gets bigger, it gets uh, more dilute during this process because it's 100,000 atoms uh, distributed over, over a small um, volume and then this volume expands. And to make it possible that we can measure this atoms after four seconds, for example, um, we need to slow down this expansion. And this expansion can be expressed in micrometers per second as a unit, or one can also take the mass of the atoms and some physical constants and uh, calculate a temperature. So the, the expansion of this cloud, we can, we can say, hey, we have 60 micrometers per second and nobody has an idea how cold or how, how slow this is and how, how less of, of energy inside this cloud this is. But if we say we have 38 pico Kelvin, this is something that people can imagine what this what this may be. So our goal was to slow down this the expansion of this cloud as much as possible. And the byproduct was, okay, hey, we are the slowest expanding cloud of atoms that has ever ever been created by by humans mm-hmm. and uh, we we put a put a temperature on it and said okay it's 38 pico kelvin above absolute zero the coldest man-made spot in the universe 
And it was a huge success and we were we were very very happy about this result but um this was not our goal our goal was to create an, an atomic ensemble that's that is uh, suitable for for meta wave interferometric measurements and uh, after this hey we have 38 pico kelvin um the the the, the fun just started we <laughs> we uh, are now in the phase that we want uh, that we make uh, meta wave interferometry with this ensemble and do the real physics mm -hmm. and the the ultra coldest uh, the, the the coldest spot in the universe we we call it sometimes uh yeah it's just a byproduct so 38 pico kelvin is 38 trillionths of a degree above absolute zero is that correct i think so in germany we have other prefactors for for trillions and billions right. uh, <laughs> but, but i it's it's a lot of zeros uh, after a lot the, of zeros, after the, um, but the the, the lowest temperature ever recorded and produced by humans. Yes, got it, and that's very yeah. very cold. And and so I, I think it's I think it's also funny to me too, as you were explaining this, that you know that there's a lot of uh, physics jargon. It's very complicated. It's you know it's very technical. But when you released this information to the public, everybody latched on to the temperature part, not the cloud of atoms moving really slow <laughs> part. Was that annoying to you guys or was that kind of funny or did you think people would be that interested in that aspect of the experiment? Mm, I think it was everything. Um... <laughs> We we went through through all the phases. Um, the, the the first few weeks were great and, and funny, and then then it, it focused more on the uh, on the temperature thingy and not that much on the hey you have this cool uh, atomic ensemble that you can do met, um, um, meta wave interferometry with. The next thing is strictly speaking, it's not really a temperature. Mm -hmm. Because attention physics jargon, uh, temperature is if the ensemble is in a in an equi equilibrium state, so the atoms in the cloud are moving in one direction, bouncing from a wall, moving in another direction, bouncing with each other, moving with the next wall, in a in a in a, in a confined environment, and an expanding cloud does not have a confinement, and the the state of matter we are using is not not a classic thermal cloud, but it's a uh, another state of uh, of matter called Bose-Einstein condensation, quantum mechanical stuff. <laughs> I, I, I won't go too much into detail with this, but the um, the velocity distrib distribution in a Bose-Einstein condensate is different to the velocity distribution in a classical thermal ensemble. So the term temperature is strictly speaking not not correct that's why in the in the um, publication that we publicated <laughs> <laughs> um, we did not say we have a temperature of 38 pico kelvin but we have a internal kinetic energy of 3 over 2 mm. kb times 38 pico kelvin and then it's physically and, and technically technically speaking uh, more correct than just saying, hey, 38 pico Kelvin is because it's, it, it, it's it sounds like it's it, almost impossible to measure temperatures at that level on a thermometer because thermometers don't read those temperatures, basically. Yes, and a classical thermometer um, needs to be in thermal contact with the specimen one wants to measure. And a thermometer has 10 to the 23 atoms. And our cloud has 10 to the 5 atoms. So the thermometer with room temperature, if we put it into our cloud, the cloud heats up to room temperature and we can't measure the temperature. Anymore. Ah, I see. Okay, okay. And the, the scheme that we are measuring the temperature is we create a bose einstein condensate, we cool it down to 38 pico Kelvin. We let it freely expand for 100 milliseconds, measure the size. We do the same sequence again because the, the detection process is uh, is dest destroying the Bose-Einstein condensate because it's it's heating the cloud and uh, 
we, we shoot a laser on the on the cloud and measure the shadow and from the from the density of the shadow we can calculate the density of atoms in the cloud mm -hmm. it's called absorption detection if someone wants to look it up <laughs> google for absorption detection so we we measure the size after after 100 milliseconds 200 milliseconds 300 400 500 and so on we went up to two seconds of free expansion and from there we can calculate back what was the expansion velocity what was the temperature and so if yes. you in theory had a drop tower that was much taller would you in theory have more time to observe the behavior of this atomic cloud yes okay so is that yes. more of a <laughs> a funding logistical construction um hurdle that you guys are are you is that something that you are interested in trying to pursue or is this something um, you're trying to work within the what you are what you have available actually the drop tower is capable of producing not just 4.7 seconds of microgravity but 9 9.3 seconds the experimental capture can not just be dropped from the top to the bottom having 4.7 seconds, but it can also be launched using a catapult from the bottom mm. to the top, and then it falls back to the bottom. And during this uh, vertical parabola, uh, during, the, during this whole flight, there is uh, microgravity. So the same height of tower, uh, the, the, the same tower height can almost double the microgravity time. Got it. And does that happen yeah, longer, simultaneously? The drop and no, the... It's not. Okay, it's so it's not each... possible to have them simultaneously. Okay, so each each drop is four hours about of preparation. Yes. Okay, got yes. it, got it. Okay, <laughs> because because the whole tower, the whole one hundred ten meter tube, um, has to be evacuated, because uh, air in the tower would produce drag that would break the capsule mm. during the during the fall, and that would. Um, disturb the, the microgravity. It, okay. it would make it impossible. But yeah, a higher drop tower would be nice, but <laughs> acceleration scales quadratically with time. So to get uh, to, to double the, the free fall time, we need a four times higher tower. Mm -hmm. And that would be really we, high. We, we very fast uh, get into the into an area where we don't want to build <laughs> uh, laboratories like this. So the the next logical step is to uh, take the same experiment or a similar experiment and uh, put it on a on a rocket. Mm -hmm. And this rocket, uh, it's in, in in Germany. It's called Höhenforschungsrakete. Uh, in English, it's a sounding rocket. Um, it's not going into orbit, but it's uh, just flying up, two hundred seventy kilometers high, and then it falls down and has uh, six minutes of microgravity time. Wow, six minutes versus, you know, that that's, that seems like a very big difference. Yes, yes, it is. Now, usually comes the question, when will you do this? Um, the answer is five years ago. <laughs> so this, this rocket already flew, and that's why this, this whole Quantos Mayos collaboration is 60 people and uh, many universities. Because simultaneously to our experiment, uh, colleagues of us uh, worked on on a rocket mission and built a similar experiment and uh, launched this um, and produced the first bose einstein condensates in in space. Got it. In 2017. That's awesome. Five years ago. Well, something that I like to talk about on the show, you know, we talk to a bunch of really smart people like you, but kind of trying to understand what the implications are of research like this. So I, I guess I understand why you're trying to understand these atoms and their movement, but what are some of the implications of the answers that you guys are coming up with? You know, it's one, one thing that I, I kind of wrote down was sort of a byproduct is you're figuring out more sensitive measuring instruments through a lot of this work. And so sensitive, these more sensitive measuring instruments could help answer a lot of questions about climate change and changes in ice mass over time and things like that. 
so for you, what are what, what are some of those bigger picture implications from from these answers that you're getting from these experiments? Mm, yeah, as I said, the the idea is to do meta wave interferometry, and with meta wave interferometers, um, we can measure accelerations. That may be gravitational acceleration. That may be um, inertial uh, acceleration if you have a plane or a spaceship or a submarine and you don't have access to to GPS. You don't know exactly where you are. You know where you started and you measure how much did I accelerate in this and this uh, direction. And from there, you can calculate where am I. But if you have, let's say, a side wind or a flow of water coming from, from the side, this effect may be very small and not measurable with classic accelerometers. Accelerometers, every one of us has an accelerometer in his uh, smartphone that's that's used for uh, tilting the screen if you tilt the smartphone. But these accelerometers are not very sensitive and they would not be able to measure if the plane gets a very small side wind and drifts to one side and over time this drift can lead to a very large position uncertainty. So if you think the airport is right in front of you and uh, you have side winds the whole flight, this, the plane uh, drifts away and uh, you don't find the airport. And um, with this meta wave interferometers, it will be possible to measure this uh, sideways accelerations very, very precise with a high sensitivity. And, and, and another thing is, sorry for, for interrupting, um, I, 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 want, I don't want to leave the impression that we are only doing um, a replacement for, for GPS. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> acceleration measurement, um, we, we can take an experiment like ours and put it somewhere on Earth and measure the acceleration on this specific spot with a high sensitivity. And... Um, we can do this over time, so we can measure movements of tides, mm -hmm. of, of water flowing. We can, uh, if we do this over years, we can measure if glaciers and uh, ice is melting and where the water uh, is is flowing. Where well, this is something that that uh, that we would do if we put it on a on a satellite and fly around Earth and measure the local acceleration. On different spots and from this uh, local acceleration we can model what what happens on earth mm -hmm. uh, directly under the satellite just from the uh, acceleration uh, information yeah so is there any movement on that kind of research right now monitoring accelerations on earth across many different factors yes yes it is um there are some let's call them classic Measurements, uh, it's it's uh, missions called GRACE and GRACE follow on. Don't ask me what GRACE stands for. <laughs> um, it's it's two satellites flying on the same uh, on, this, on the same path, but a few hundred kilometers um, away from each other. And if they uh, move over a higher gravitation spot on, on Earth, the distance between the satellites changes. And from this distance change, uh, one can measure the one. One can calculate the uh, local gravitation underneath the satellites, and with quantum-based sensors, uh, this this can be done on a on a more precise scale. And research on this area is is done right now. Yes. Got it. That's that's. It sounds really amazing, and the implications could be really helpful. Um, yeah, across many this, different... this whole topic is, is summarized under the uh, quantum sensoric or quantum sensing. Uh, so mm -hmm. building sensors based on, on quantum effects. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I love this kind of research because it, it, I think the implications help average people understand the importance of this kind of work, if that makes sense. I feel like it can get physics can get very complicated and very jargony and very technical. And so when you sort of um, produce the fruits of all of that work in a way that people understand and understand how it could impact their lives, you know, I feel like people really latch on to that. And so, what, you know, going back to 
the temperature side of, of things. Um, I just wondered if you could kind of explain. So, so we already established that you were able to achieve, you know, quote unquote temperature at 38 picocalvin, which I think w- was 38 trillionths of a degree above absolute zero. But what actually is absolute zero? And how would you explain that to somebody that doesn't really understand physics? Yes. Um, okay. Explaining this to someone who does not, who, who hadn't uh, studied physics. Temperature is movement of atoms. So the higher the temperature, the higher the velocity of the atoms. And absolute zero is the point where the atoms don't move anymore. Okay. The way to absolute zero, the atoms move slower, 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 and even slower. And at some point, they are totally at rest. So a a bowl of soup would have more atomic movement than an ice cream cone. Yes. Okay. (laughs) Got it. (laughs) I'm with you. And so absolute zero is the lack of movement, complete lack of movement of atoms? Yes, exactly. Okay. And this this point is not even theoretically uh, reachable because of quantum mechanics, um, but but we wanted to uh, explain this for people who hadn't studied quantum mechanics. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I will keep it uh, on this statement. But how, so, so it, it's impossible to reach absolute zero, but what does that actually mean if you were to talk about the laws of thermodynamics? Like, what does that actually mean? Why aren't we able to achieve absolute zero? Um, we aren't able to achieve absolute zero because um, if the atoms don't move, they it's it's something called a uh, principle of uncertainty. You can't know the position and the velocity of of an object with with um, infinite precision. Okay. You either know the position or you know the velocity, but not not both uh, at the same time. So it's um, sort of an, an, and, an unknowable. Yes. I mean, it's really complicated stuff. And, and that's why you guys with the PhDs do the work that you do, you know? Um, yeah. But I, I, I was just kind of thinking about the, the, the quote unquote temperature that you guys were able to achieve in the drop tower. Does that temperature exist elsewhere in the universe or could, could potentially exist elsewhere in the universe? A temperature above, like slightly above absolute zero? As far as we know right now, it does not exist somewhere else in the universe, in the known universe. I don't know if it's possible by nature, because we we don't just took something from nature and and uh, made it cold with, I don't know, in in, in a fridge you have an expanding gas uh, that's that's taking away energy from from the system here we are using lasers we are using magnetic traps we are using uh, radio frequency uh, excitation of atoms so that's very very technical uh, stuff that does not happen uh, by accident in nature mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so probably so I, unlikely yes <laughs> okay <laughs> maybe, Unli- maybe there are agents who, who do uh, who do the same research uh, as we and they got 37 pico Kelvin. I don't know. Got it. Got it. But it, but it would take some sort of inter intervention and y- you, you really have to create these, these circumstances in which you are reaching this temperature. Yes. Okay. Yes. I understand. Okay. So aliens maybe have reached it before, but basically, I mean, you guys really did create the, the coldest place in the universe. For a few seconds, it sounds like. Yes. You, that's, yes. that's really true, possibly. <laughs> Unless there are aliens that are doing the same so, or similar I'm, I'm yes. Got it. Okay. Um, so I just kind of want to wrap up a little bit. What are, what are some takeaways from this experiment for you and your team? Other, other kinds of work that you want to do and research with the information that you've already gathered? Tough question. <laughs> um, the, the the whole the whole experiment uh, that we did was more or less a pathfinder experiment for future experiments on rockets on the ISS, for example, or on on satellites. So in in real and and better microgravity conditions that we have here on Earth, and for building this sensors for acceleration measurement, rotation, and 
fundamental constant measurements and, and stuff like this and, and so on and so forth. Um, it's a tough question because it was one tiny step on this on this long road towards the meta wave interferometer on a satellite. And um, yeah, it's it's not it, it, we hadn't reached the goal. We 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 just finished one step. Mm -hmm. And everyone got it's really big, excited about that a, one it's step. A, it's, a, uh, it's a it's a huge step, but um, but yeah, in a few years, what we did this delta kick collimation and a meta wave uh, lens system for collimating the expansion of a Bose-Einstein condensate, it will be a side note in a paper. In a, in a publication, because mm -hmm. uh, the real physics, uh, the interesting part happens after this. Got it. And can you, you know, see yourself working on the International Space Station one day, you know, working in, <laughs> in you know, gravityless conditions to, to do more research on this? <laughs> um, myself not working on the International Space Station or, uh, or in microgravity, but... Um, I'm not working for the University of Hanover anymore because my contract finished. Uh, but I moved to the uh, German Aerospace Center in Hanover, one kilometer away from the University of Hanover, and uh, working on a project called BICAL, Bose Einstein Condensate and Cold Atom Lab, um, that is aiming for building similar experiments for the International Space Station. I'm, I'm right now. I'm working again in the same uh, in the same uh, topic. Got it. And is this is this mostly um, mostly an all German team? The Quantos uh, project was a German collaboration, um, but the Bicker is uh, a, a collaboration between um, Germany and and NASA. We are the the, the guys that have uh, the experience in building this this machines, and uh, this is in our hands. And yeah, NASA is, is our partners. Awesome. So when are you going to be doing another um, drop? When's the next drop? <laughs> <laughs> next, ne next week, I think. I'm not, not part of the team anymore, so I, I'm not that deep into this uh, the drop schedule. But um, when I left the team, the experiment had been dropped for 270 times. Wow. And since then, it has been dropped another 150 times or so. Wow. I, I, I don't know if they uh, cracked the 400 drops mark, but I think they are not that far away from that. Got it. And and if you remember, how many drops did you have to do in order to confirm the readings you were getting, I guess? Um, 15, I think. Yeah, I think it was 15, something in the 15 drops that we had to do. Wow, and that's a lot of preparation to do fifteen drops. Yes, and during <laughs> this during the sequence, uh, because it's a very uh, very sensitive device, so we we drop it one hundred meters dis, uh, decelerated with uh, forty times the Earth's gravitation, and everything shakes. And uh, the lasers we are using are very robust, but small misalignments can lead to a, a small decrease in optical power in our vacuum uh, uh, chamber and optical power is, is is key to to do the first cooling steps in our experiment um and and if this power decreases the whole performance of this uh, the, the apparatus decreases and one can nicely see that during the the campaign it gets worse and worse and worse and uh, we we have to or we had to uh, interrupt the campaign to realign everything and mm. that, that that's a lot of work that has to be done in between yeah. the, the campaign. So, even so it's not just drop, yeah. drop, 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 drop. But yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot drop, of realigning, yeah, drop, drop. slight adjustments, very slight adjustments, it sounds like. I, I always had a really hard time in school understanding atoms. Like to me, atoms didn't didn't really make a lot of sense. I didn't understand how 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 we figured out what an atom was, you know, how we kind of figured out what an atom, quote unquote, looks like, you know. So when you are doing the or when you were doing these readings, um, 
what actually does that look like? You know, you're not, and sort of like the, the cameras that you were, or the lasers and everything that's sensing what's going on in the capsule. Like what actually, is it all just kind of data that you're looking at? Are you getting actual images of something? What does that look like? Um, we get we get pretty nice uh, images from from our atom no clouds. Way. So we don't see we don't see uh, single atoms, mm -hmm. but we see um, we see the shadow of a cloud. Wow! It's like it's like um, if you are in the kitchen and you open the 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 pot and uh, steam comes out, mm -hmm. and you shine light through the steam, then you can see behind the steam the light um, is less intense than. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, on the sides where where it it did not get uh, blocked by the by the steam. That's basically what we are looking at. So you see the evidence of the atoms, but not the atoms themselves. Yes. Got it. That's so cool. That's really cool. Do you think there will be a time in our technology that we will be able to capture an image of an atom? Is that possible? It's it is possible to see single atoms, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it depends on what you're looking at. Uh, atoms are built up from, from protons, from neutrons, from electrons, and with different uh, measurement techniques, um, we, can, we can observe the electron hull of the atom or the, the, the proton core of the atom. Um, it depends on whether we are measuring the electrostatic field of the atoms or if we hit atoms with neutron beams and measure the deflection of the neutrons um, from the cores. But taking a camera and making a snapshot from a, <laughs> uh, from, a from an atom, uh, I think this is not possible. But we, we have a fairly good understanding of uh, how atoms look and mm. a lot of tools to look at different parts of the atom. Got it. What was your favorite part about this experiment? Mm, everything, I think. Everything and nothing. So <laughs> after after one week of laser uh, realignment, I hate lasers. Mm -hmm. But after five weeks of searching for software bugs in the control software, I wanted to go back to the lasers. So <laughs> um, the, the, my my favorite part of this experiment is the uh, is the diversity. So I in the, in the beginning I, I I said it's not I, I I'm not focused on one on one subsystem or one part of this experiment but but i'm focused on on everything and i'm i'm not an not an expert but i know very good what happens where yeah this 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 mixing of uh subtopics this is the, the most interesting part for me awesome yeah as i said um i'm i'm working right now on the uh the iss implementation of our experiment and, and that's the International the Space Station in partnership with NASA, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. And um, yeah, this is this is the work that I'm doing right now. Got it. Preparing the build up of the experiment, uh, preparing preparing all the documents necessary for for working on the ISS because it's not drop tower in, in the drop tower. If you want to change uh, change something, you just do it. But on the ISS, since it's a human space flight, you have to fill in a lot of documents and make sure that every safety precautions are taken. Sounds a lot more complicated. It's it's, it's a lot more complicated, a lot more data, <laughs> a lot more documents. Uh, that's that's what I'm doing right now, which is interesting. Um, but I'm I'm also happy to to go back to the laboratory sometime. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the research that you and your team, um, you know, come out with. And um, Christian, thank you so much for coming on to the, the show and explaining the incredible work that you and your team did um, at, at ZARM. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And um, yeah, thank you for explaining everything. It was really awesome. I hope it wasn't too, too complicated, too, 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 too messy. And, uh... I don't think so. I, I was, I, you know, I, I was like, well, if I can kind of understand him, I think, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> if I can follow, I feel like anyone can follow. Yeah. Thank you for having me.
You can find more information about the research discussed on this episode by visiting our show notes page at wildlensinc.org slash ETH. And let us know what you thought of today's discussion by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts and joining the discussion on our social media pages at Earth to Humans Pod. Earth to Humans is a production of the Wildlands Collective. It's produced every other week by Serena Simons, Matt Podolsky, and Hannah Mulvaney. Our intro sequence was edited by Matt Podolsky with shouting assistance from the Foothill School of Arts and Sciences kindergarten class. If you liked what you heard and want to support the work we do, consider joining our Patreon campaign for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash earth to humans. Audio samples used in the intro sequence were provided by the Macaulay Library at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and today's music was by Blue Dot Sessions. 